It's the year 2013, and 18-year-old uh, me, who's almost two years deep into his fat YouTube career, is looking for some cool games to play, or maybe just some cool games to look forward to at that year's E3. Mostly, I was hoping for a new Halo, as even though Halo 4 wasn't that great, it was still my main game franchise at the time. And uh, I was also looking to find some more information about GTA 5, which was another game that I was also really looking forward to. But then E3 started, I went through the conferences, and all they really showed was a, a CGI trailer for Halo 5 Guardians, which didn't really tell us anything, other than that, yeah, a new Halo is in development, I guess. And then nobody really talked about GTA 5 as well, so... I was, I was a little bit disappointed with everything, but I decided to stick it out anyway and watch the Ubisoft conference as well, which I remember was last up that year. They showed a new Assassin's Creed game, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, they showed some more Watch Dogs, and it all looked alright, I guess. Uh, but then, to end the show, they also showed the first trailer for The Division, which was their new IP that was being developed by Massive Studios, and it got quite a bit of attention from a lot of people for a few reasons. With the first one being that, well, you know, the game was an open world game and open world games were all the hype at that time, you know, just look at the crew, even racing games went open world. Uh, and then second up, you know, the game also looked very, very good. It looked years upon years ahead of its time. The animations, the visuals, the effects, we just hadn't really seen anything like it yet in a video game. Even looking back at this now, it looks insane, like it actually looks insane. Uh, the world also seemed to have this seamless PvE and PvP system combined where players could just do missions together, uh, get some loot, get some gear and then also randomly run into another group of players that would want to try to kill them. Uh, it was sort of like this MMO system with PvP enabled areas and it, it got a lot of people excited and then on top of that the game also had a bunch of other stuff that we just hadn't seen before like this flying drone that was later at Gamescom to be revealed uh, to be a permanent team member that you could play through the companion app on a tablet or a smartphone. I, I'm not sure exactly how they planned on making this work, but it was new. It was fresh. Lots of fresh ideas seem to come from this game. And it is the reason that I started talking about it on my YouTube as well, not much after Gamescom. I was just really looking forward to this because, wow, we hadn't really seen anything like this, right? But even though I really wanted to know more and more about this game, the information that we had, it was very very scarce most of my videos on the channel that i uploaded came down to making a wish list like what things do i hope to see in this game or just listing every gun that we had seen in the trailer so far because that's important i guess <laughs> it really wasn't oh and then around uh, january 2014 i also made about three videos talking about the release date and the delay and that kind of stuff so that's basically all the content that you could make about this game in the first year of its announcement my channel basically came down to weekly three to five minute videos breaking down something super insignificant in either one of the three trailers that we had if i didn't know any better i'd say that you know looking back at that old channel that, that i was milking it for the views but at that time i also only got like a thousand or two thousand views per video and i wasn't really earning much at all so uh, I guess I just really liked playing detective and just breaking down the trailers to see if I can find anything hidden before anyone else. I mean, what else was I going to do, you know? Definitely not going to school. But yeah, a whole year goes by, we get a little bit of information here, a little bit of information there, and then we arrive at E3 2014. And this would be the year that Ubisoft and Massive, they would show us what this game is really all about. Except, it still wasn't the year. The trailer that they showed us, it looked very, very good. No doubt about that. But it was basically the exact same trailer as that we had last year. Only the location was a bit different. Uh, it was still New York, but it was in Manhattan and not Brooklyn. And maybe the weapons that the characters used, they were also a bit different. But yeah, just, just look at this. The camera pans down from the sky all the way down to the character. We get a look at the character. Then the character opens the map. He selects a point where he wants to walk to. He walks over there, meets another group member. They fuck up some NPCs, they get some loot, and then the camera zooms out again. That is basically the 2013 trailer, but also the 2014 trailer. It's the exact same thing. The, the thing that was sort of good about this, though, is I guess that we got some new information. Because besides this trailer, we also had a behind-closed-doors demo that you weren't allowed to record. But someone recorded it anyway and, you know, gave it to me. <laughs> and I couldn't really use it on my channel, but what I could do is just recreate what I saw in After Effects, which is pretty much what I did. Uh, and those kind of things gave us a whole lot of new stuff to talk about, I guess. 
You know, we could go in-depth about the base of operations, about the inventory system, about some of the weapons. Uh, we could talk about the map, which would obviously be very, very large, because the location from the first trailer and the second trailer, they were really, really far apart. So we were like, yeah, this map is going to be like, whole of New York, that's insane. Looking back at it, that obviously wasn't the case, but we didn't know any better, and the developers weren't exactly fast to correct our mistakes. They just kind of let the hype build up, so to speak. Now, I will say, though, that that same year, after E3 2014, information became a little more loose. Uh, but a lot of the information that we seemed to get, it, it was very conflicting. Uh, just, just to name a quick example, we had one article that said that the 2015 release was 100% confirmed. And then another article said that the 2015 release is probably not going to happen. Those articles released at almost the exact same time. And, you know, at that point, as a YouTuber that's looking for information, you're like, what the fuck? And there was a lot more stuff like that. For example, an article on examiner.com that has been deleted by now uh, said to have an exclusive interview with uh, Frederick Rungfist, which was an executive producer on the division at the time. Uh, and in that article, they talked about the green zones and, and what they were and what they kind of did for the player as opposed to the dark zones. Uh, and it was it was an interesting topic, at least I thought so. But then when I went to Gamescom a few weeks later to ask about those green zones in an interview, and yes, I had an interview with the exact same person, Frederick Grunkfist, but then when I asked about the green zones, he absolutely had no idea what a green zone was. And I was like, how, how is that possible? You just you just gave an interview with, with examiner.com about this very topic. And apparently... That wasn't the case. So yeah, this was my first question on the interview. Let's just say that the interview did not run as smoothly as I hoped it would. Uh, I wish I could still show you the interview, but it seems that I deleted that video a long time ago, which makes sense if I think about it, because it wasn't a good interview. So, uh, Gamescom goes by, we get more information, we get a couple more trailers, a bit more footage here and there, and we fast forward another year. Um, yes, the game still did not come out. And now we're at E3 2015, where we get another trailer for The Division. This time, it's a different one though. It's not just a copy and paste from the last one. Uh, this time it focuses on the Dark Zone. And we get the confirmation that the game will come out in 2016. Yet another delay. Now, first impressions of this trailer is that it looks downgraded. For sure, it doesn't look bad, you know, uh, the game still looks very good, but the footage that we have right here, it certainly does not even compete with what was initially shown at E3 2013. Uh, this was also the year that I went to E3 myself. I've already told this story multiple times in a couple of my other videos, so I won't go over this in depth again. But basically I did a whole bunch of stuff there, recorded a whole bunch of interviews, I, I took a whole lot of notes, but when I came home and I put it all together, I just really felt that I was lied to a little bit about this game because so much of what they previously claimed about this game it just ended up not being true uh the game just changed so much from what they initially promised it to be and, and a large amount of fans kind of felt the same uh we got to figure out that the map wasn't as big that we didn't get to control a drone that the graphics just weren't as good that the skill system just wasn't as complex that there wasn't any stealth gameplay or any melee takedowns that there was only one base of operations and the list just goes on and on and on, really. I, I mean, the game wasn't bad, right? It was still a very unique experience, and it was still something that I could enjoy very much. But there was certainly this feeling of eh, disappointment it, that it just wasn't going to be what we all hoped it would be, especially when the beta dropped and we got the first glimpse of what this RPG slash shooter experience was really going to be like. There was just some disappointment in the air. Uh, but yeah, skipping past the alpha, skipping past the beta, skipping past all the additional information that we got over that time, heading straight to the release date of March the 8th, 2016. Uh, the game launches, it actually sells very well, it goes into the history uh, as Ubisoft's best-selling new IP ever. That's definitely worth something, but unfortunately the game just wasn't able to keep that player base, that was its biggest problem, there was just... That was just a very big lack of content. The Division had a main storyline which was about 10 missions in length. Uh, these missions they were fun to do. Uh, the story wasn't exactly something like The Last of Us, but it was a fun experience. You know, you could shoot up some mobs, you could have some fun. And then you also had the same four to five side missions copy and pasted everywhere on the map. Which I gotta say, got boring pretty fast, but if, you know, if you wanted to get max level, which was level 30, you had to do them, and, and you just did them, you know, you might, you, you might as well do them, get some good items, it wasn't really too big of a deal. After that, after you completed all of those things, you could go into the dark zone, 
and collect Phoenix credits to get some high-end blueprints, which was about a day or two worth of grinding. And then, after you had those blueprints, you could craft your best items, and then there was nothing left to do apart from killing undergeared players in the dark zone that did not play a cinch launch for 12 hours a day straight. Replaying the missions wasn't really worth it because they didn't grant you those level 31 item level high end rewards. Uh, you needed those dark zone blueprints to get the best items, so you know, why play the missions? Uh, the side missions they weren't replayable, which trust me, nobody wanted to do anyway, but them not being replayable meant that the map was really really empty, with maybe a few random NPCs in a, in a few random locations, maybe a boss here and there, but other than that there was just nothing, so yeah there, wasn't, there, just, there just wasn't much to do, like what are we gonna do in this game apart from just killing each other in the dark zone? Uh, another problem that the game had was that there were just so many bugs and exploits on launch day. And I don't mean the small things that can be quite an inconvenience, but you'll get over them. No, I mean the big game breaking glitches that practically gave you infinite damage or exploits that let you get loot far faster than anyone else in the game. It was, it was basically a rule in this game. If you weren't doing specific exploits to get your gear, you would fall so far behind the rest, all the people that were exploiting, that it was almost impossible to recover from that. So you had the group of players who just accepted the fact and started exploiting anyway, uh, which included myself. And then you had the ones who just said, fuck it, I'm not gonna play the game like this, I'll just quit. And I guess that was the majority of the player base because the player base fell off fast. Then, patch 1.1 dropped, and this patch hit like a truck. Not in a good way. It added a couple of new features, such as item trading and gear score, but the main chunk of new content was Falcon Lost and the gear sets. Falcon Lost was hyped up to be this raid-like experience where the best players had to work together to complete a special mission for powerful gear. And it was sort of that, but it also ended up being a big horde mode, where players had to fight in a big room for 15 waves in a row to kill this APC. There was a twist though, because of course there was a twist, because every NPC took four magazines to kill, and every NPC would kill you back in two bullets, especially those especially those damn shotgunners, man. The, the fucking shotgunners. I, I still got nightmares. So basically what this mission ended up being is a mission where four players just hide from NPCs in, in a pit uh, in the middle of the map and slowly pick off NPCs one by one with a pixel peek for 40 minutes straight. That was not a fun experience and unlucky for you if you died in wave 15. Because yeah, you gotta start all over again. Now try doing that with matchmaking groups. Doing it with a pre-made group with communication was already hard enough. But then half of the people in the matchmaking didn't even use a mic. Didn't even have a proper build to start this with. So how was anyone going to complete this? I guess the fact that the game did not have anti-cheat was a, a good thing for some people here. Uh, because hackers were making a lot of money carrying normal people through these missions. Because they could basically use their RPM and their teleports and their uh, insta revive cheats I guess to carry normal players through the missions and not only was this mission just a pain to do and not only did you have all this bullshit going on the mission itself also had a million bugs and another million ways to cheese it just like the rest of the game you gotta watch some of these clips just to realize how broken the game really was sure most of these exploits were fixed 48 hours after they were discovered but in those 48 hours some of the players had already farmed and cheesed the mission so many times that we again had the same story you either exploited and geared up or you got left behind and you couldn't gear up anymore because the mission was so damn difficult it just wasn't a good time to be a division player then patch 1.2 arrived about a month later which brought us four new gear sets and a new incursion as well the incursion itself was a lot less broken this time around it was also more fun uh, but the rewards themselves, they were pretty bad. Striker, Sentry and Tactician were basically so strong that there was no need for Lone Star or Hunter's Fate. I guess the patch wasn't all that bad though, because the developers added some stuff to combat the lack of content. Uh, with HVTs and Dark Zone Supply Drops, filling up the open world of the game a little bit more. And they also added a rope cut feature, <laughs> a rope cut feature to the game, which then upset a whole lot of people. I, I don't think that the rope cut feature was a bad idea, but the timing of implementing this feature definitely was. People on the forums, people everywhere were already complaining uh, about the few players who exploited to get all their gear and were now unkillable in the DZ. 
And now these people would have another way to deny others from gearing up in the first place. <sighs> It's just, why would you implement this feature at such a bad time? It also didn't help that the HVTs basically only rewarded Lone Star items, which was far worse than any of the other sets. So yeah, again, the update just wasn't the success it needed to be and players kept on dropping. Another month later, patch 1.3 dropped, which you could say was the final nail in the coffin. This was really the low, low point of the division. The incursion that came with it was actually pretty good, uh, Dragon's Nest, it was the best incursion we had so far with uh, the most complicated mechanics I'd say, the four horsemen were pretty cool to farm, uh, and, and the underground was an extra fun game mode, but replaying both of those things, you know, the incursion and the underground, it became old quite fast, and the patch just didn't do anything to address the core issues of the game. Instead, it just made things worse. The developers really, really wanted the players to grind for those new gear set items that they introduced with patch 1.3. So they gave the gear sets ridiculous bonuses while nerfing some of the other sets at the same time. Uh, I remember that Striker and Sentry went to having a five piece at some point, uh, but then they gave Reclaimer a feature where you could give infinite explosive ammo to the whole team, which actually caused players to stagger. Or remember Deadeye, just hip firing that M1A and critting every bullet? PvP was already a joke in this game, but now it just became a clown fiesta. One shot sticky bomb builds, smart cover builds, which basically gave you 7 million toughness, one shot sentry shotgun builds. This, this shit was bad, it was very bad, and even this patch introduced a whole lot of new bugs and glitches as well, to the point where. I was basically only making videos complaining about the game at this point and how this should change things up. Which then, it wasn't too good for my channel, obviously, I was just complaining all the time. Because I just couldn't play this game seriously anymore, it was just such a mess. Not to mention that hackers also ran rampant at this time. Like, every single server on PC just had someone racing past you and one-shotting you through walls. Even the developers got stream sniped and ganked by hackers whenever they would stream. Now, if that doesn't send you a message of how broken this game really was, then I don't know what will. The player base was tanking very hard and it seemed like there was really no coming back for this, like a lot of people stopped playing here. Then the developers did something unexpected and delayed their survival DLC to work on something that they would call Patch 1.4, which didn't add any new content per se, but instead focused on fixing the game as much as possible. The interesting thing here is that the developers didn't do it all by themselves and instead announced that they would be inviting active players over to their studio to give feedback on what they came up with for Patch 1.4 and provide additional ideas on top of that to make it even better. Now, this sounded like music to my ears. Right after I heard that, I started working on a video with some ideas that I had for this patch, which I released on my YouTube channel and then as a result of that I got invited to that group which would later be called the Elite Task Force or ETF for short. ETF Alpha if I may add because obviously I'm alpha as fuck. No but seriously we would have ETF Bravo and ETF Charlie later in the lifespan of the division but that's we'll get there when we get there right let's let's focus on alpha for now while over at massive studios we did exactly what you would expect us to do we sat in a conference room for eight hours a day and we just talked about everything that straight up sucked about the game and how we can improve it uh to make it a more fun experience we had different topics each day the first day was like just everything the second day was skills and, and mechanics the third day I'm not sure what the order was, I just know that on the last day we also played 2 hours of survival, which was the DLC that was supposed to release after 1.4. And I remember that we worked very hard to put all of these ideas together and make them just work, so to speak. So yeah, we did that, we, we put all the ideas together, then I went back home and then I was just waiting for the patch to happen, so to speak. I could kind of follow the whole progress and I could still sort of stay in touch with the developers through the ETF forums, which was like uh, just a separate section of the Ubisoft forums where you could just, you know, talk about the stuff that isn't officially announced yet. And, and then, you know, then the patch dropped. And I'm not going to sit here and say that patch 1.4 was the greatest thing to ever happen to the division and that it was completely perfect because I would be lying if I said that and I'm probably also a bit biased as well on how good that patch actually was because I worked on it myself so obviously I'm gonna say that it's 
amazing. But uh, what I can say about this patch though is that it made a whole lot of the dead content in the game. You know, the missions, the everything that you just wouldn't do anymore. It made that playable again because everything would now actually give proper rewards. You weren't forced into the DZ or forced into Falcon Lost anymore. I can also say that this patch reduced the tankiness of the NPCs and how hard they hit. It got rid of most of the completely broken gameplay mechanics that destroyed the PvP experience, such as the ridiculous amount of damage resilience that you got from smart cover or the or, or or the healing where you could just step in and out of your heal to heal yourself over and over and over again you remember that being in the game that was just ridiculous it removed a ton of annoying bugs and created a whole lot more build diversity it was the first time that we saw fat electronics builds rise to the top and actually be good and not be just some joke you know where uh, why go electronics? You can just get skill power rolls on your gear. That was the meta before that. We could also play with assault rifles and LMGs instead of just following the SMG and 1A combo that everybody had to run prior to that. And even though anti-cheat wasn't really improved that much, uh, there was this big, big ban wave where the developers would just throw out bans 24-7 to any active cheater that they could see. Uh, even in real time, the developers went to people's stream as they were live streaming and they would just sit there all day and every time a cheater would show up, they would instantly ban that guy live. Uh, so yeah, it, 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 was, it was a good update and it brought players back to the game as a result. Then, patch 1.5 hit, only about one month later. And this was the patch that really brought some people back. Because on top of the ban waves and all the fixes that I mentioned just a second ago, the game now also came with a sort of battle royale style game mode that did away with all the players gear and made everybody fight uh, on the same level uh, with no gear to start off with, with a mission to go to the dark zone and then extract. You had to fight the cult, the virus, uh, a new enemy type called the hunters and of course other players in your session. This was fresh, it was a lot of fun, it was a new take on the division without all the bullshit so to speak. And people really, really enjoyed this. Not everything was perfect though about uh, patch 1.5 because the survival game mode wasn't the only thing that the developers added to the game. Uh, you know, we had this game mode that was survival, but then the developers also just changed up the main game around to steer up the meta. Uh, and this time it wasn't really in a good way. For instance, they made it to where enemy armor damage would now also have an effect on players in PvP. And since assault rifles had 22% enemy armor damage to begin with, and since players had about 55% damage mitigation from armor, that instantly made assault rifles king in PvP, basically making the M4 the go-to weapon for everybody. A few exotic gear items such as MC skull gloves and barrel chest piece also got added to the game which then forced players to play Lexington Event Center over and over and over again until they finally got lucky enough to get one of those which then defeated the purpose of a, of a lot of the good changes from patch 1.4 to where players could now play every mission and still get good rewards. Uh, this was basically the patch of the Alpha Bridge meta and for the longest time everybody just ran Alpha 4 piece with Savage and Refreshed or maybe a specialized backpack, something like that. Uh, and just go double M for assault rifles with as many damage talents as possible, sometimes even up to 8 if you count competent and adept on the sidearm shotgun. The game wasn't bad though, you know, the game had problems at this time, the game wasn't perfect but it also wasn't bad. Players at least kept playing and the developers, they, they realized how important communication was with the player base. Uh, so for the next update with patch 1.6, they not only created another ETF, which would be called ETF Bravo, but they also dropped a public test server to test pretty much the whole patch on for about a month. So like the whole player base could just go and see what the patch was like and, and run into uh, some broken things that could then be fixed for the main game. And that was a very good decision because even though 1.6 gave us stolen signal, which is the best incursion by a Mao, most of what they introduced in the PTS was completely broken at the time. Uh, you had players having insane amounts of effective HP, this time through the mobile cover damage resilience. Uh, and through the smart cover as well. You had a weapon that got more damage the more electronics you had, making you a skill build player and a DPS player at the same time, which was just completely broken. You could spawn kill players in less than without them being able to do anything about it. it. It wasn't looking pretty, I gotta say, but most of all of that, it got ironed out. Apart from the Airburst Seeker Mine, which did an insane amount of damage with the new skill power scaling that this update had as well. 
Yeah, the Airburst Seeker Mine, I'm pretty sure we remember all of that. The problem wasn't just the Airburst though, it was also that Stamina got nerfed, so players couldn't really build for a lot of HP anymore to survive versus the Burst. It made healing skills a lot stronger, of course, because we had less HP to heal, but it also made Burst damage a lot stronger, and that is why the Airburst was so good that patch. It was the skill with the most Burst, and it got really, really cheesy as it could basically one-shot pretty much everybody. Airburst aside, Alpha Bridge did get a fat nerf though, which meant that everybody simply switched over to the next best thing in line, which was an all high-end slash exotic build. You know, those things that everybody farmed Lexington for, those items would be the new shit to run now. And this, this patch wasn't, wasn't too great, I think, and it took Massive a very long time to respond to this new still meta of just high-ends just healers and just airburst players it really felt like when they did not respond for months that they just gave up on their game now that all the major dlc had been released that's that's how it felt to me i'm not gonna lie even the year one celebration was very underwhelming the developers basically came out and said that for the year two dlc they weren't going to have any map expansion or any major content uh so year two was basically a time period where the division would be left on autopilot. That's sort of what they said. And, and, and with that being announced, the players started leaving again due to either being bored or them thinking that the game doesn't have a future. I was one of those. I thought that the game just wasn't going anywhere anymore. So I just, I just left for three months straight. But then the developers came back and said that they wanted to put out another ETF team, ETF Charlie, to provide uh, proper feedback on patch 1.7 and patch 1.8. And that was a bit surprising to me. You know, as a part of the ETF, I was still able to read those forums that I talked about earlier, where developers would also drop a lot of their IDs for uh, future updates. And I very soon realized that the developers had changed their plans of action and actually decided to go all out on patch 1.8 to try and push as much content into this game as possible with the resources they still had. Of course, I wouldn't be able to talk about any of this yet because it was all under NDA, but when patch 1.7 came out and I knew about patch 1.8, I got excited for what was coming and I kind of came back to the game as well. Uh, patch 1.7 brought us loadouts, accommodations, classified gear and global events, which then also brought a whole lot of other players back. Uh, it gave the game a second life, so to speak, almost. It gave players a reason to play the game again. And then, after some time, right before the third global event went live, the developers dropped patch 1.8, which came with Westside Pier, which is a map expansion, even though they said they weren't going to do a map expansion. It came with two new game modes, Skirmish and Resistance, and it came with a whole lot of changes to the game that would rebalance out a lot of what was broken. Uh, of course, fixing some bugs, tuning down some gear sets, you know, buffing some other things. The patch and all of its content was also completely free. You did not need a season pass to play any of it. Uh, and this is what also made a lot of people want to try out the game again. Very conveniently, it was also the patch with the most build diversity. We had Nomad, Predator, D3, Striker, Reclaimer, Final Measure. All of those gear sets are very, very strong, either in a solo setting or in a group setting. And even within those gear set choices, you could alternate how you would build them. Do I go for 6k striker, 9k striker, 7.5k striker? They're all viable. The one thing uh, that I didn't really like about the gear sets though is that the bonuses were so easy to activate most of the time and so powerful in comparison, which really lowered the skill ceiling of the game a lot. You know, patch 1.6 and onwards, the developers had already taken some measurements to bring the top players a little closer to the new players in terms of skill, but the difference was never this small. The best way that I can put it is that from patch 1.8 and, and onward, you aren't really fighting players anymore, you're fighting gear sets, and some players like that idea, and others don't. Rogue 2.0 also came with patch 1.8, which was another thing that sort of helped the casual player in the DZ. I don't think this was bad, I think it was pretty good. I like the friendly fire thing, it was actually a good change in my opinion. Going accidental rogue was just such a broken and stupid mechanic, but some of the buy-off mechanics and the, the crush to this skill gap that I talked about just a second ago, it really changed the way that the DZ was played. Um, a lot of people used to take the DZ fairly seriously. We all knew how broken the game was, but we also respected the, the PvP for what it was. Uh, there was still a lot of skill to it, and that really changed with patch 1.8. Now more than any time, the DZ has sort of turned into this joke where uh, players just stand next to each other and just call each other names and just do random shit, anything but fight each other. They're just memeing on top of each other, and uh, and that's I think that's the way the DZ is going to be now until the servers shut down. Not to mention that since 1.8... 
Hackers have also returned to the game, and this time around there's not a ban wave to really take care of them. So, uh, a lot of the times you will see hackers on PC, so the moment you go rogue you just get mowed down. And then on consoles you have this shotgun with the Cronus Max thing, where uh, they just abuse the auto aim on the shotguns to get easy stacks on their striker and that kind of stuff. So, really? PvP? Taking PvP seriously? That kind of died with patch 1.8? Other than that, the game got a whole lot of content and it brought a whole lot of players back to the game. 1.8 wasn't the last update though, we did get a couple of small updates after that. Uh, we got a few legendary missions and a few changes to some gear sets. Uh, Predator got nerfed, Nomad now only works when you're solo, at least a six piece. And we had two new global events that, uh, you know, brought uh, again some players back to the game. Shields have also been introduced, which are basically extra accommodations that give you rewards in the Division 2 for doing things in the Division 1. So that's another reason for players to start playing the Division today, I guess. And even though we might still get an update that sort of nerfs Striker, I'm just saying massive, wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, it is very obvious that full focus has been put into the sequel, which means that it's unlikely we're going to see any more major updates for the Division 1. So yeah, in about eight months, we're all gonna leave the Division and we're gonna start fresh with the Division 2. Now what I hope is that the developers have really learned from all of this, learned from this whole cycle, and built the Division 2 from the ground up to where cheaters cannot just fly around the map and one-shot you with their LMG to where the game isn't just riddled with glitches and bugs. I really hope that the new improved version of Snowdrop Engine can really just take care of this, and I also hope that developers can respond faster to problems when they appear this time around. Because problems are always going to appear. Every game is going to have glitches and bugs. It's how you handle them. That's also important. The developers have said though, multiple times during interviews and on stage, that they've learned so much these past few years. I mean, how could they not with this history? I am actually surprised that the game did survive for so long. About a year ago, I watched Dado, which is a big YouTuber on Destiny, make a, a similar video to this, uh, but then about the history of his channel and Destiny instead of The Division. And at the end of the video, he spoke about how Destiny should have died and his channel should have died as well because of all the mistakes that the developers of Destiny made throughout its lifespan. And I really feel like the same counts for The Division and my channel as well. During the days that the division was bad, I didn't even bother to make any other content or videos about anything else. As some of you might know, I went missing in action for like two, three or four months without really uploading anything. Maybe one or two videos here and there, maybe not even about the division. Which, if you don't know yet, that is really bad to do for a YouTube channel. And combine that with the fact that the division was pretty much gaming's biggest meme at some point as well. I'm just looking at this and thinking, this should not have happened, you know? I, I shouldn't be here anymore, my channel should not be here anymore, the Division should have died a long time ago, but... Uh, as it turns out, I'm still here, still doing Division videos, waiting for Division 2 now, and that just goes to show how much people actually want a game in this genre that is just good and that just works. Destiny 2 could have been that success for Activision and Bungie, but I guess they screwed up. I just hope that the Division 2 is the success that we all imagine it to be, so that we haven't stuck around all this time to be disappointed once again. I'm fairly optimistic, even though I may not always sound like it, I like to be uh, an optimistic guy, but I guess that only time will tell. So yeah, as always guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you guys later, or like they say in the Netherlands, see you later.